Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on vector calculus for electromagnetism. This is video number 46, and I'm going to derive the Bo and Savar law. In my series of tutorials on vector calculus for electromagnetism, there are a number of videos which are relevant to this particular video. In numbers 45 and 46, I derive the Helmholtz theorem. The Helmholtz theorem is the fundamental for the theory of electrodynamics, and the der derivation for the Bo and Savar law also requires the Helmholtz theorem. In video 42, I took the gradient of 1 over the magnitude of the separation vector, and in video 19, I took the curl of the product of two functions, a scalar function f and a vector field capital A. Now, in addition to this, we will need some results from magnetostatics, and you can look at my video series on magnetostatics if you require. Now, really and truly, people will say one of two things about the Bo and Savar law. Either A, it is a law which people found through experiment, or B, that it can be derived via Maxwell's equations. So, of course, if you're doing a beginner's course in electromagnetism, people will tell you that it is an empirical law and it cannot be proved, and it's basically found through experiment. And if you're doing a more advanced course, you will derive it via uh, Maxwell's equations, I suppose proving that it is not, in fact, an empirical law. So I will be employ employing some of the results from Maxwell's equations and from uh, our study of magnetostatics. So perhaps it isn't suited really to put this video in my uh, series on vector calculus for electromagnetism, but that's where I'm putting it nonetheless. So to begin, we need to do a small bit of revision, and I would suggest, I'd be very surprised if you're not familiar with these particular topics. So first of all, there is an analogy in terms of what we're going to do between the study of electrostatics and magnetostatics. So let's start with some revision on electrostatics. We know that we can apply the Helmholtz theorem and write the electric field as minus the gradient of a scalar function V. We call the scalar function V the electric potential. Gauss's law for electric fields can be written in, in a differential form and that is that the divergence of the electric field is rho the charge density divided by epsilon zero the permittivity of free space. Putting the two of these together, we're able to get a version of Poisson's equation. In this particular case, we have the Laplacian of the scalar potential is equal to rho over epsilon zero. Note, by the way, that where we have zero charge density, this is equal to zero, and we talk of the Laplace equation. Now, in general, there are two ways of solving Poisson's equation. Firstly, you can apply the method of power series, and I've discussed this power series solution to differential equations in my tutorial series on differential equations. Another way of solving it is very clever and it uses the Dirac delta function, something which I introduced in uh, the last number of videos. So the solution when you apply the Dirac delta function to Poisson's equation is 1 over 4 pi times a constant outside of the volume integral of the source of your field divided by the magnitude of the separation vector. In this particular case, the constant will be 1 over epsilon 0, and the source will be the charge density, rho of r prime. And we get the functional form of the electric scalar potential. So, to take a small bit of a step back and remind us, on the top right of your screen, I've written the Helmholtz theorem. So, let's say we have a, an arbitrary vector field, capital F. An arbitrary vector field, capital F, via the Helmholtz theorem, can be written as the sum of the gradient of a scalar function, u, and the curl of a vector function, w. The minus sign in front of the gradient of the scalar is largely a matter of convention. And I've written the formula down for the vector field, w, and the scalar field, u, as well. Note, of course, that they are functions of the primed coordinates, and primed coordinates are for sources, and unprimed coordinates are for uh, detectors. Now, I need to relate the functions uh, w and u to, the, uh, to our vector field f. So one of the ways of doing this is noting that inside w and inside u, we have other fields c and d. Now c and d can be written in that d is the divergence of the vector field f, and c is the curl of the vector field f. Now, I'm sure you know what's going to happen next. For magnetic fields, we apply the Gauss's law for magnetic fields which says that the divergence of the magnetic field is zero. And this is, of course, for magnetostatic and magnetodynamic situations. 
By the way, when I talk about magnetostatics, we're talking about constant currents rather than constant charges, because of course constant charges do not co constitute a current. Anyway, so if the divergence of the magnetic field is zero, what that means is that the vector field D up here is zero. If the vector field D is zero, that means the scalar field U is zero. And that means that we cannot write the, the vector F in terms of a scalar. So we can't use a scalar potential. What's left over is the vector potential. What me, the, uh, this means that we can write the magnetic field in terms of the curl of a magnetic vector potential, W in this case. But in actual fact, we call the magnetic vector potential capital A. So if you look closely, you need to take the curl of this vector field. I've taken out the 1 over 4 pi, I suppose, just for uh, aesthetics. And we have 1 over 4 pi outside of the curl of our vector field, capital A. So we have the curl of B over the magnitude of the separation vector integrated over the volume. So of course, this is the, we can rewrite this really straight out, that B is the curl of the magnetic vector potential, A. Now, using Ampere's law, we can rewrite this very easily. And if we, one sec there now, it's after deleting things for me. We can write it using Ampere's law, and that B is equal to minus mu zero times J. Mu zero is the permeability of free space, and J is the volume current density. So doing the exact same thing as we did over on the top left with, the ele with electrostatics, we're going to come up with our own Poisson's equation. So in this case, we're going to get that the Laplacian of our vector field A is minus mu zero times j. Or applying the uh, solution to this equation, we get that A, as I said a minute ago, is mu zero over four pi times the volume integral of jd tau prime over the magnitude of the separation vector, which we've seen already. So I suppose in many ways, I'm, I'm moving backwards and forwards, just giving us an intuition into, into uh, I suppose, what the magnetic vector potential is. Now it's time to use it to prove the law or derive the law for BO and Savar. To recap, we know that B is the curl of the magnetic vector potential A, or the curl of mu zero over four pi outside of the volume integral. The trick here is to note that we have one over a, we have a scalar function or a scalar field, which is one over the magnitude of the uh, separation vector, multiplied by a vector field, which is the volume current density. J, J prime or J of R prime. So I'm going to rewrite it as such, and we say that we have mu zero of four pi outside again, but I bring, I explicitly write it as the curl of J prime over the magnitude of the separation vector. And here what we do is we apply the product rule I discussed in video 19. So we take the curl of the product of a scalar and a vector field, and we get, we get uh, the scalar field F outside of the curl of the vector field, minus the vector field cross product with the gradient of the scalar field. So that means we turn this particular equation here into this equation down here. So we double the amount of terms. Now, the important point to note here is that we had a minus, we have a minus down here, but in a moment we will change that to a plus. And the reason we can change that to a plus is we note that we're taking the gradient of one over the magnitude of the separation vector and that's going to be equal to minus the separation unit vector divided by the magnitude of the separation vector to be squared. So a minus times a minus will give us a plus, which is here. So what we really have now is an almost complete formula for the vector, or excuse me, the magnetic field in terms of the volume current density J and the separation vector. There is but one more thing to realize. If we uh, I suppose, analyze or evaluate this particular term here, note that in the middle of it, we are looking at the curl of the volume current density. But the volume current density is J prime or J of R prime. So it's a function of the primed coordinates or the source coordinates. Whereas the, uh, the NABLA operator is not a function of the primed coordinates, it's a function of the unprimed coordinates. So that means when you take the curl, it's going to be zero. The only time it would be non-zero is if you take, let's say if we took the curl, or an unprimed curl with respect to an unprimed j, or if we took a primed curl with respect to a primed j, then it would be non-zero. But in this case, we have a mixed, we have mixed terms, and the result is it's going to be zero. 
This means the term on the bottom left, as we see, the first term on the bottom left is going to be equal to zero. And we're left with B, the magnetic field, is equal to mu zero over four pi, outside of the volume integral of the volume current density as a function of R prime, cross producted with the separation unit vector, divided by the magnitude of the separation vector to be squared, integrated, like I said, over the volume. And this is called the law of Bio and Savar. Now, there are different ways of writing the law of Bio and Savar. You can write it if you want with respect to volume, volume current densities here, or with respect to surface current densities here, or just with respect to the, the current itself in a line. And that's a pretty straightforward jump, and if you want you can see my videos on magnetostatics if you don't understand those jumps. So the law of Bio and Savar is very easy to derive once you understand vector calculus for electromagnetism. And if you don't, of course, well then it becomes uh, very difficult and very convoluted. And if you haven't done the prerequisite vector calculus, then of course you can probably understand why some of your instructors might say it's an empirical law. And most definitely, it did start out as an empirical law, and later it was it was later proved, just like uh, Newton's law, or Newton's second law, we'll say. Now, there is one more thing I'd like to note. If we look, let's say, at the first of these three forms of the law of Biot and Savar, note that we're taking the the curl. Excuse me, we're taking the cross product between this should be j prime, by the way. This should all be primed. So it's the primed j, and we're taking it. We're taking a cross product with a unit vector. And we're dividing it by the magnitude of that unit vector to be squared, or the magnitude of the vector to be squared. Now, I can tell you that this particular cross product is not easy to compute, calculate, to, um, to visualize, or anything like that. So, most likely, when actually using the law of Vo and Savar, you will find it very difficult for that reason. Geometrically, it's very difficult to understand. But nonetheless, we have proven, or we have derived the law. So the law comes essentially from the Helmholtz theorem and one or two small other uh, observations from the study of vector calculus. So thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel, and you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.